Luke has been leading us through an amazing history of God's providential ability to use everyday people's stories in accomplishing his purposes. We often don't read it that way. We read it as a sacred book and we think it's something that is very different than what God is doing in the world today. And yet every day of our lives, God continues to do the very same thing. He enters into everyday people's lives like you and like me. And if we allow him, he takes our story, makes it part of a much grander story, and through it is accomplishing his purpose for eternity. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Pretty amazing. I mean, think about it for a minute. A young girl named Mary, probably 14 or 15 years old. And God says to her, you are favored among women, and you will be the mother of the very Son of God. Wow, talk about getting your life interrupted. Sometimes that's what God does. He comes into where we are, but he says, I have a little bit different idea for you. Think about Elizabeth. Here you got it with Mary, a young woman whose life interrupted, but imagine Elizabeth in her old age all of a sudden becoming a mother. Wow, that's a little bit of an interruption. I remember when my mom was 43 years old, she had her fifth child when I was 13 years old. She was a little surprised. Of course, that young baby became the apple of her and my father's eye, but it was a little interruptive. I can't imagine Elizabeth. The shepherds we've talked about, sort of the bottom rung of the culture, society, right? Did they expect that God was going to come and use their story and that here we would be thousands of years later telling that story over and over and over again? Not on your life. It's part of the reason the religious leaders were so ticked off. God would come and announce something to these guys? Wow. Everyday people. Everyday despised people. And God says, no, your story is going to be part of my story. Then you have the leper, right? Untouchable. Who Jesus touches and uses his story to proclaim the good news that the king is here, the Messiah has arrived, a new order has begun. Eternity has touched now. And then you have the paralytic, right? The guy who was so determined and his friends that he carves a hole in the roof and goes down. And he is healed. His life is transformed, not just physically. Because remember, Jesus said first, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, that ticked off the religious leaders too. Who can do that kind of thing? And then last week we heard about this immoral woman who everybody knew who she was. And as one of the religious men said, if he, Jesus, knew who she was, he wouldn't let her touch him. This is an everyday story that God is using for a grand story that literally has yours and my eternity in its hands. I'll never forget my first call church in Chicago doing a small group study with a bunch of young couples. And one of them was a really cool guy in the community, big businessman. And he would come once in a while, you know, Christmas, Easter. His wife and three kids came regularly, and she always used to say to me, uh, oh, how I wish he would come, how I wish he would be part of this. So he did agree to this small group with these couples, and I went to the, their house one evening for a dinner meeting, and he said around this table, I was sitting next to him, he was talking, he goes, he goes, that frickin' Bible is really interesting. <laughs> I think he modified the word for my sake, but he said, that's really interesting. I said, yeah, it is. And he said, it's really bothering me. I said, wow. So 
so one Sunday when we wanted to do a small group emphasis like we're doing last week and this week, I said, his name is Brett. Brett, well, how would you like to give a little testimony about small groups? He, oh, I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not that kind of guy. I don't do that kind of thing. I said, that's exactly why I want you to do it. Because God enters into people's lives who are not that kind of guy. Who are not that kind of gal. So exciting to watch and see what happened to this man. And about mm, maybe 10 years later, I get a Christmas card. Got a Christmas card from him every year. I still do. But about 10 years later, got a Christmas card from him after I was gone from there. From, and his wife wrote a note in the back of it. He said, I wish you could see Brett today. He's that church lady man. <laughs> he's serving communion. He's doing this. He's doing that. He is just, he's with our family all the time. He's a changed, transformed person. She said, he's the man I always prayed he would be. Isn't that exciting? That's what can happen when we are together in community. That's what Jesus does. That's what God does when he enters our lives everyday ways. But he always does it together in community. I challenge you to find any place in the Bible where Jesus comes, where God comes in the Old Testament, acts unilaterally with one person without there being a community that is engaged, involved, and it's all about. This is what Hebrews 10, 23 to 25 says. We're taking a little side trip out of Luke today in order to emphasize and help each other understand how important it is that if we are going to belong together in Christ, it's going to take being together more than Sunday morning. So listen to what Hebrews 10, 23 to 25 says. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and the more as you see the day approaching. One translation says, provoking one another to good deeds. I don't like to be provoked. I don't know about you but sometimes I need to be provoked. I need people who love me and know me to elbow me a little bit and say, come on, Candy. Here's a place where you need to do something. Here's a place where you need to modify. Here's a place where I think God is working in your life, as well as being able to say, wow, look what God is doing in your life. It's all, both of those things. But this passage in Hebrews very briefly tells us that life together is based on Jesus, the one who is faithful, right? It's he, the one who is faithful, that we gather in the name of. And it says very clearly, let us. It's a group project. It's a bodybuilding effort of the whole body of Christ. Christianity and faith is not a solo sport. My friends in college used to say, I go to Bedside Baptist, meaning I just do it on my own. Doesn't work, because faith is about the body of Christ, being together. So I want us this morning to very briefly look at these shared stories that we've talked about in God's big story, and look at small groups as a laboratory for this kind of being together, remembering that Jesus is the one who is faithful. None of us are faithful. If our relationships were based on our personal faithfulness, none of us would be sitting here this morning likely because we all lean toward being tempted to be unfaithful in all sorts of ways. It is the one who is faithful, Jesus himself, who brings us together because the grace that we've been talking about, the grace that we believe that is over-the-top generous is only possible because of Christ. It is that we are in Christ, in the grace of Christ, that we are able to be together and have these laboratories for growing in being like Christ. Last Sunday, I was a little bit surprised. I, maybe some of you were too. It's at our second, no, does Lizzie come, did she come to the first service? The Venemans? 
she usually came sat in the back with a little tiny baby. Um, a year and a half ago, they came to this, this congregation, Lizzie Vineman, her, her father Phil, and mother Paula. And I don't even remember how I met them, but I ended up having coffee with Lizzie and bringing her to one of our Bible studies. And through that, some of you know, she ended up having a little preemie baby, uh, three pounds when she was born. Last week, they moved a little sooner than they thought, and so I was a little stunned by how quickly they were going. But in tears, she came into our office this week because you all became her family. You all supported her. We tried to give her a shower, but she ended up in hospital on bed rest. Women brought gifts to the hospital and did a shower in the hospital for her. Cards, encouragement, all sorts of things. Loving that baby, and Steve and I double-dipped her a while ago, that little baby. We baptized her in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in this community, knowing that they would be leaving soon, but that we would be passing them on to another community. That the reason we belong together isn't because I'm so nice or you're so nice or Steve is so nice. We belong together because God is so faithful. And unless we are in community, living everyday life with each other in the grace of Christ, that kind of thing doesn't happen. Christ brings us together. And God always speaks and acts in community. He always does his work in and through gathered people. Grace in Christ. Grace with each other. How many stories I've heard from you that it is in your small group where you have gone through divorces, you've gone through death, you've gone through loss of job, you've gone through new grandbabies, you've gone through new jobs, you've gone through new life, both victories and s failures, both, both pain and absolute joy. You share that together because you're together and you can share in that spirit of trust. You can struggle together and you can celebrate together. Because God always speaks into our everyday failures as well as our everyday successes. He uses both. And he uses us when we belong to each other. Grace with each other. Grace in Christ. Grace with each other. And I wanted to just show you, we do have a library here at church, you know. And it's primarily a discipleship library. Books to help us be in community together to learn about the grace of Christ, to learn how to be together. I just wanted to highlight a couple of those that are free for the checking out in the library. Two of them are classics. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, which um, is one of the classic descriptions of what it means to be in Christian community. This is a little newer one by Gilbert Belzikian called Community 101. Really cool, one of the professors that I had at Gordon-Conwell. And then two newer ones, I love this one, Community is Messy right? And most of us, when community gets messy, what do we do? What do we do? We leave. We quit. We give up. Oh, no. The one who is faithful says, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare leave on each other. You stay together because I am what binds you. It is my faithfulness that will see you through. So community is messy. The perils and promises of small groups. See, I've warned you. The other one is called The Search to Belong, Rethinking Intimacy, Community, and Small Groups. These are not just for small group leaders. These are for anybody who wants to read them and help their small group or the gathering that they're in be more like what Christ has called us to be. So take advantage of those books. We have grace in Christ. We have grace with each other. Through all the struggles and triumphs of life, God speaks into those places most. And I've heard that from you over and over again. And sometimes it's not necessarily a formal small group. Sometimes it's the choir. Sometimes it's a mission trip where people become friends and trust each other and care for each other, and they continue to do that. I would say half the time when I find out someone that has a care need, needs something, before I get to it or anybody on staff gets to it, a small group, the choir, or somebody else is already there working. That's the body of Christ, united by the faithfulness of Christ and growing together in that faithfulness that makes us who we are. And then finally, grace for others. Grace for others. Grace in Christ, grace for us, each other here. 
but always grace out there. There's several books you can pick up that talk about the holy huddle, where we get together and we just adore each other. We just are the best thing since sliced bread, and we do for each other, we care about each other, we fight, argue a little bit, but then we hug and make up and we're all good again. But if we don't take that somewhere else, the scripture makes it very clear, even this passage in Hebrews, we're to provoke each other to do good things out there. Because from the very beginning, God's initial word, initial action was always blessing us to be a blessing to others. All that we have been given is meant to be given away even more. Jesus said this, all the things that I've done, you will do greater things than these. How is that possible? Because the grace of Christ is in us. We have the power of relationship, grace for each other, that then thrusts us out into the world, into Rancho Sotomudo, into FAM Ministries, into Ecuador, and says, what God has given me, I must give away. This is the power of being together. The verse in Hebrew says, don't forsake, do not fail to be together, as is the habit of some. Don't do it. Don't allow yourself to be isolated. Don't allow yourself to be alone. Don't allow yourself to not do it with others. This is the call of Jesus on us, to be his people in Christ with each other, but for others. We always, always need to answer this call together. Because Jesus died for me, yes, but he died for the world. For God so loved the world. The faithfulness of Christ is big enough to hold us together. But we have to learn and grow together. We have to be messy together. We have to struggle and fight and resolve and reconcile and show the world, my goodness, if there isn't a day and time that we need to demonstrate that Jesus is the main reason we are together and that all other things don't matter and that we are for those who have no one. We are for those who don't have what we have. My friends, today is the day. We must answer that call and let us do it together Today out on the patio again, there will be a table for small groups. If one of them doesn't work for you, we'll find a way. And it's for all of us to be together in order to do what God has called us to do, use our everyday stories for a grand story. Don't miss it. Let's pray. Lord God, might you speak to us this day each of us, wherever it is that we need to be called to, to be called about. Might you help us not to be alone and help us to, in you, in your faithfulness, in your love, in your amazing grace, as we sung this morning, find a way to live this messy life together. Find a way to not leave, but to stay, to find a way to commit to one another through the thick and thin of things. And might it be a beacon to the world that is busting up all over, breaking apart, dividing. Might we be that place where people can come knowing that it is in your grace we live, it is with each other in your grace we live, and that we are here for others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.